So hi everyone and welcome to a new episode of The Pivot of Change. Today I have a new guest, Kevin, and he's a revolutionary coach, facilitator, speaker, and also a freestyle MC. And he kind of combines both worlds, so the ancient world and the modern world. And he was raised up in Texas and he left his academic uh, career in psychology and he chose to travel around the world and mainly around Asia. And he started to study many different pathways of yoga, breath work, communication and leadership, and also mysticism. Uh, and he now combines the traditions in the East and in the West and kind of gives us his own unique approach. And yeah, so he combines the best of both worlds and to create a channel uh, to activate creative codes of his allies and clients. And what it all exactly means, we'll also dive into a little bit later, but I'm really happy to have you here, Kevin. Yeah, thanks for inviting me, Sana. So, so glad to be here. Yeah, cool. So kind of what inspired you to kind of take a different path and really to travel more around the world and see what more is out there instead of just staying in Texas? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a bit of a long story, but I guess the salient points that are coming up was, you know, I was I was following what I thought was the best move, right? Like, get a really good job, prestige, all that. For me, it was, you know, becoming a PhD in evolutionary social psychology and like these, these fields. And, you know, I was pretty dead set on that. But, you know, I just kind of hit some bumps in 2012 started to really like dive deep into personal development, you know, had, you know, some breakups that had sent me into a bit of a depression at the time. And I was studying yoga, I was studying martial arts. I was doing a lot of deep inner work and I kind of had this like crisis, just feeling how dead and unexciting the academic world was for me, even though I loved the concepts of psychology and I loved a lot of it, what it represented, but on a deep level, you know, it was just not where I wanted to be. And so I was kind of faced with that and it became more and more painful. And as I wrote more and more and, you know, was in nature alone more and more, it just became obvious that I had to make a big change. And so I kind of had like a full breakdown, like hero's journey, dark night of the soul experience. And I just decided that I was, going to completely quit like everything at the time my job you know sell most of a lot of my stuff and just move to California and drive my car and that's kind of what started that season and then I just as the more I got into digital nomadism and researching minimalism and then I really started to study yoga I started to get into the conscious community started to you know go to a lot of workshops and events and then create my own um, that's when I even like quit the next job I got which was also in academia to backpack Asia and India and just really dive deep. And at that time it was all about yoga for me. You know, I did my teacher training in like the Iyengar tradition and also was in the Osho bioenergetic tradition in India. And that was just like a massive wake up call for me. Yeah. So that's, that's quite a radical step to kind of leave everything behind. And Oh yeah. Yeah. So while you were doing that, there also like a lot of fear come up or oh, completely or making the right decisions. Yeah, I mean there was there's tons of fear and tons of like doubt that, you know, I just I would capture in writing and really like be honest with myself and just knowing that no matter what the fear or doubt was, what was on the other side of feeling stuck and like not excited about the way my life looked was worse so it's like it almost didn't matter what the fear was or the doubt of how it was going to look because i knew i had to do it yeah so what was kind of like the biggest lesson you learned um on like traveling to asia and studying yoga what was kind of the biggest if there was one and like a really big insight you had yeah, I would say just the biggest one, you know, I was reading Paulo Coelho. I mean, I was reading a lot at the time, but Paulo mm -hmm. Coelho, The Alchemist, I think one of the greatest books of all time. And a lot of Carl Jung, I was studying my dreams. I was writing all the time. I wanted to be an author as well as, a, you know, a yoga teacher and a teacher of meditation, all that. And 
it just became so obvious to me that most people, most of humanity, for through most of time, all time, has neglected their personal biggest desire or dream for safety, for kids and family or the church or the government, whatever. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just now at that point in my life and in this age, there was no excuse for me. And so I just realized by going all the way into the East after going all the way into the West and going through academic pathways and the mind and then going into spirit and just going into these deep silent retreats and doing a lot of yoga and soul searching and time in nature, it became apparent to me that, you know, this was not the path for me. And this was not a way to fulfillment and a way for me to live. And so I had to really get honest about that and find out what was really true. And so that was like the massive awakening at the time. Yeah. So what were like those dreams and desires that you kind of suppressed? Um, mainly it was, you know, just wanting to be in that creative life, that entrepreneur life and wanting to live on my terms, doing what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it and just fully express myself, whether I was writing a blog at the time, I was really dead set on being an author and being, you know, a digital entrepreneur and had a blog, which, you know, was just my first attempt at doing anything and I had no idea what I was doing, but that I just, that was the bottom line. I had to be self-expressed. I had to create, be creative and I had to do it on my terms. Mm -hmm. And do you still have the desire to really be an author or has that shifted and changed for you? Yeah, no, not only do I, I'm actually in the process of editing the kind of first draft of my first book, which I have two co-authors and it's all about sexuality, gender identity, masculinity, philosophy. It's really powerful kind of trialogue series. So that's, that's happening and that'll be published um, by the end of the year. Oh, that sounds good. So yeah. what I also very curious because you talk quite a lot about masculinity openly. You really ex also express yourself in that. So how did kind of like also studying yoga and, um, seeing a completely different sides of masculinity for you really impacted your image or your view on what masculinity really is and means to you? Yeah, I mean, I guess as it relates to yoga, if you're asking about that and some of the Eastern mindsets, it's much more about awareness and presence. You know, the masculinity I grew up with I definitely had mentors that were very powerful and I would see like as really good role models for what it means to be a man. But by and large, it was kind of immature masculinity, unintegrated, not in touch with their, their yin or their feminine side at all. Um, completely well obsessed with sex, money and power on the lower vibrational level, let's say mm -hmm. and that's fine. That's fine until it's not until it creates a lot of, pain for usually the man and whoever else is in relationship with him. So what yoga offered me more than anything was like being at peace with myself and stepping into deeper layers of awareness around masculinity, around the kind of the Eastern mindset and thought structure, which is all about deep presence and awareness and how fully you can show up to reality as the masculine I am and not get so caught up in all of the trappings of Western life, which can be very mm -hmm. negative and toxic, let's say. Yeah. And so kind of who were like your bigger role models when it comes to masculinity? So who you looked up to or maybe um, really get inspired by and also maybe for your book as well. Yeah, I would say, I mean, some of the deepest thinkers that have inspired me have been um, Elliot Hulse, who's definitely, he's been a mentor of mine and a big speaker out of that. Um, currently, Jordan Peterson is probably the number one. Um, back then, it was, back then, it was like really Alan Watts, Terrence McKenna, and Osho. Those were like the big three. And even beyond that was Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud. That was just my, that was my wheelhouse, still is to an extent. 
Um, but specifically on masculinity, I would say Jordan Peterson and Jocko Willink are the top two men in the world right now who have podcasts, who have large you know, followings and are speaking out about true masculine principle thinking and power and command and authority that's not coming from this unintegrated place. It's more of boy psychology, let's say, instead of man psychology. Okay. And why have they really inspired you so much? What was it about them that was different than other men who were also more like public figures or really out there in the media? Yeah, I mean, if, for me, it's just truth embodied. Like, mm -hmm. you can say all the right things and have all the right followers on Instagram or have a book published, and there's plenty of people out there. And they have good things to say, but mm -hmm. when I look at the person, for me, I'm very intuitive. So, so I look at the person, I make eye contact, I watch them talk. If they're not fully embodying what they're talking about, they're gone for me. And if you dig mm -hmm. layers deeper, it's like the unintegration you know, they're playing a game and they're giving lip service, which is fine if you're at an entry level. But after reading Jung and studying myself and just really going deep into my own consciousness, you know, I chose my mentors based on where I wanted to be, not just the appearance, right? So I think that's, that's really, that applies to all student-teacher relationships, let's say. Yeah, so and you also mentioned that also Osho, I think, really also inspired your work and what you do right now. And can you maybe, I think I know that Elliot Holes also works a lot with the meditations of Osho. So can yeah. you maybe share how you apply that, like maybe in the work that you do right now? Yeah, I think, you know, it's definitely not for everyone. And I would invite anyone to really discover for themselves what resonates. Um, for me, it resonated deeply because it builds on the work of Wilhelm Reich and bioenergetics, Alexander Lowen. It's all about emotions are stored in the body. It's not just conceptual. You can't just talk about it. You have to breathe. You have to move. You have to express the repressed. And the Osho, you know, dynamic kundalini meditations and his thinking really his philosophy is just so earth shattering if you've never encountered something like it he's a rascal guru he's not orthodox at all it's very very like controversial and there's a you know documentary made about his movement on netflix that's pretty controversial and i think does a decent job of showing that that light but yeah, in my work now, it's just, it's shown me so obviously again and again, first with myself, then with clients, then at events I'm leading, or anything I'm doing, that you have to go beyond the mind. You have to go beyond words. It's, it's usually messy. It can be chaotic. It involves the breath. It involves movement. It's sweat. It's tears. It's your voice. And it's way beyond the level that, you know, clinical psychologists and psychiatrists in the mainstream, let's say, would have you believe. There's actually a lot of stuff that, not more than 90%, I'd say, that's primal, that's unnameable, it's beyond language. And those meditations are a way to tap into that. Yeah. So to really mainly also release and express everything that we're kind of holding on inside. Right. I think because I think it definitely in the Western culture, we always need to kind of control ourselves the way we behave speak and act and think and i think right. to have to have a safe space where you completely can express it in is really powerful i was right. also wondering um like from a male perspective and also for you to with your experience do you think there's a difference between the way um a man like the masculine heals and the feminine do you think there's a difference in that I think, yeah, there's definitely differences. Um, I think we're more alike than we are different in that way. Like the fastest way to heal something is going to be to feel it fully. Like the pain around something, the emotional pain, whether it's sadness, sorrow, or rage, anger, is there for a reason. And it's there to move energy and create a healing process for the psyche and the nervous system. So in the end of the day, you're going to have to feel it fully. And there's all kinds of mm -hmm. techniques and facilitations and mentors that can help you with that. But you're going to have to feel those things and then restructure your reality. Um, I think on average, I can speak for men more because I'm a man. Mm. I think for men, it's really done 
with other men and in solitude. So with other men, it's very important to be with the masculine, to be seen in your sorrow and your grief, to be seen in your rage, to be seen in your expression, and to fully cathart that out and make amends and step back into command of your life and your story and your thoughts. And then there's also the solitude where men need to be alone in nature with themselves with their soul with god nature whatever you want to call it and really just come back into that consciousness i think for women their healing from what i've seen can happen maybe generally more in community where the solitude doesn't serve them as much that they can heal really powerfully with elders other women with you know healthy men around the tribe let's say and i think that's just part of what makes women women and men men and there's obviously overlap but on average i would i would argue for that yeah yeah i can definitely see some truth in there i think for women it is really powerful to really connect to nature so there's a part of solitude in there but i think the most actual healing um always happens in connection to others um, that's what I've really noticed myself and also working with clients and within groups that, um, yeah, because I think for women, really community can give that support and safety, kind of can bring mm. that healing into another level. And of course, with men as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So also you've kind of also changed your perspective on masculinity. masculinity. Did it also change your perspective on what femininity is and what it means to you. I mean, yes, yeah, certainly because they're, you know, two polarities of the same mm -hmm. reality. And yeah, I'd say what, what I just realized about femininity in the modern era and what my life has been is that a lot of women, especially older women, single mothers, married women, single women, whatever mm -hmm. are, operating in their masculine polarity a lot of the time especially in business but also in other domains and i think there's been a whole generation worldwide that has been under fathered and over mothered and so this has created a deep imbalance between the sexes or genders let us say and obviously i understand there's non-binary and there's the trans lgbtq community there's like there's a gray area but i'm speaking to the majority of the human experience. And mm -hmm. I want to focus on the, the rules, let's say, or the laws of the universe, not the exceptions all the time. Um, and yeah, I think for most women, they just want to be feminine. They want to be embodying love. They want to be in connection, in relationship. They want to be playful and you know, expressive of their desires and not trapped in their mind, but really in their heart. And that wasn't my common experience of women growing up until I started doing this work. So I think that's really how it shifted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, definitely agree. I think um, a lot of what I've noticed myself also growing up with a single mother as well was really high in business and corporation. So that there can be, that then women can try to be like men. Yeah. Right, because they're, environment they work in is very masculine so it's it's not i think for most women it's not a conscious choice but it's kind of something they roll into and uh what i've noticed myself and speaking to other women is that because we're so used and conditioned into controlling like controlling something being in control and kind of forcing instead of allowing it i think that's why a lot of women have difficulty uh, with surrendering, actually, and trusting, and being really in touch with their own intuition. And for me, starting my own business, I really started out with a more masculine approach, and it didn't work at all. And I think for a lot right. of women, we can keep it up for a while. For some of us, it's months, but for some of us, it's years and years. But there will come a moment in time where you realize this is not working. Um, and then it's right. really to get in touch with your own femininity. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So um, what you also know is that you're, you're probably really aware of it, but that we both have masculine and feminine energies. 
right? But what you said, usually, like overall, uh, excluding some exceptions, that usually men have way more masculine energy and women have way more feminine energy, right? So um, how did you kind of also, con how do you kind of also connect to that feminine energy within you and how you kind of channel it for your own good? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think for most men, you know, their feminine reality is their emotional life. It's their maybe creative life. It's also the body, like the body itself, nature is feminine. And so your consciousness, your thoughts, your actions from that level are more masculine. So, you know, for me, it became very naturally. And I also have spent a lot of time cultivating, you know, understanding the yin pole and being in feminine energy and not being afraid of it or trying to control it, but just letting it do its thing, especially with the emotional reality. Now, that being said, it, it always happens together. It's not like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm in feminine, there's no masculine, or like, you know, it's always together. There's no separating it. So in my experience, the feminine energy is much more powerful when it's contained by the masculine and actually has a, a structure or an order to flow within. Otherwise, it usually leads to neurosis or psychosis let's say like to use you know freudian terms or it, it leads to like maladaption because mm -hmm. too much of one or the other all the time unchecked leads to dysfunction yeah. yeah it's definitely i think like bringing both energies into harmony and i think also when it comes for simple for women to business and career it doesn't mean you have to be like 100% feminine all the time. Um, I think it's very important that you also have what we call more masculine, certain structure, certain containment, and also really getting a healthy relationship with action. Because that's what I've noticed a lot with within women and men that sometimes like the wounded masculine is a lot of times the reason why we cannot really take inspired action or a reason for a lot of procrastination. Uh, have you yeah. also noticed it, this for yourself? Oh, yeah. Anytime there's like indecision or procrastination or like flakiness, you know, that, that is a huge sign of like a collapsed masculine or some, some, kind, some kind of blockage there. And so, you know, a lot of men and women, I think, experience this all the time. And I certainly do. And it's a, it's a practice to step into that and step into more decisiveness and step into more you know, commitment and decision-making that's not based on your environment, but it's based on your own willpower and your own identity on a, on a beyond a physical level. Yeah. So, and are there certain things you've done or things that helped you gain insights into how to kind of create a healthier relationship to your own inner masculine, also taking action and being committed? Or like certain practices or tools or things that really yeah, work for you? I mean, yeah, the number one is, is meditation of some kind to really like have a practice, a personal practice of connecting to your inner reality. And, you know, and also just having a practice in general, having some kind of routine, even if it's just one thing when you wake up, committing to that no matter what is a complete game changer and will focus and build that energy in ways you can't even imagine over time and i think a lot of people can kind of neglect that and you know it took me years to realize that after practicing and, and experimenting that that's really the main way to build that action yeah yeah cool and it's also i also learned that when you commit to something right, for example it's a practice in the morning or whatever it is if you're not used to it especially in the beginning a lot of things can come up it will kind of try to sabotage you or um, a lot of things will show up that will kind of lead you away from that commitment. And I think that's also why these practices are so powerful that they kind of make you conscious and aware of a lot of things about yourself. So then, for example, the excuses you use for not doing a certain practice are the excuses you use all the time. Right, and when you right. can actually become aware of all these patterns, it's also really powerful. So, I always speak about it. it's not just a practice, but everything that's kind of 
connected to it that really makes you aware of uh, in what ways you're kind of still holding yourself back. So right. for you, it's been mainly been meditation. Yeah. And I say that super broadly. It's just a mm -hmm. practice of sitting with yourself, moving, yeah. breathing, dancing, sexuality, art. Like there's so many meditations out there, but just overall, that is the practice for me. And also, um, when it comes to sexuality, it would also help you to create a more healthy relationship to your own sexuality. Um, because we have very like toxic sexuality, but also very healthy, very powerful uh, sexuality. Yeah, I think the number one thing for men and women is shame. Shame mm -hmm. blocking the expression that's very natural and healthy and completely innocent. There's an erotic innocence that we all are born with, but because of society and multiple forces out there, it's conditioned negatively. And it's a journey to reclaim that. And it's a, it's a lifelong journey because we've all been raised by people and born into a culture that has lived this way for a long time of repression. So starting to chip away at that and confront it as a man is a, a journey it's a process and so it's it's really about stepping into your erotic innocence and reclaiming that and getting in touch with your desire like radical desire getting really clear and then acting into it yeah so what do you think that are like a lot of unhealthy or like toxic patterns that come up when it comes to sexuality for you personally or what you've noticed and became aware of? Yeah, I mean, the, the obvious ones are just hiding it. Like that's the number one. Don't talk about it. Don't let anyone see you doing it. Don't, don't get caught, you know, like this is, this is just extremely unhealthy because the repressed returns one way or another. And if it's completely repressed, you have, you know, deep trauma and deep dysfunction emerge and like really unhealthy expressions of it. And this is what you see with, you know, the rape culture and the death culture and, you know, the pedophilia is mm -hmm. that is the expression of the sexuality when it's been so repressed, it has nowhere to go. And through conscious intent that is very, you know, negative, let's say, or not, it's going to express. And so, that's the, the main thing is it's the repression is not the answer at all. And, and it never has been and it never will be. So that's, that's a big thing that, you know, as a society in the West, we're going to have to continue to face and we get to grow into. Um, the other one is just, you know, I think it's in language, you know, the objectification of the body and of the feminine and of even the masculine too. It's, it's actually equal how mm -hmm. men and women treat others and themselves when it comes to sexuality and desire and relationship. That's quite negative and has created unhealthy relationships between men and women and between men and men and between women and women. And so that's the other one is really retaking language and empowering the self and coming from a place of purity and desire and love and not a place of scarcity, fear and shame. And, you know, a lot of the human trafficking and the pornography industry and these, these industries out there are preying upon this mindset. So it really does start with how we think, talk and act around sexuality. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it's mainly the not being open and speaking about it. That that's mm. like the that has done the most damage so um of course there's a lot of like more abusive language or very superficial language around sexuality but i actually think that's even less damaging than the hiding and the not speaking of it i think for women it's especially a very big thing um because i noticed that for women there's a lot of shame around even speaking about it with other women. And yeah. I think it's first of all about really getting in touch with your own shame. I know that it's not really something that's actually you, it's been really just pushed or pressured upon you by society. And right. the same as with men as well, that it's not 
you is actually just a pattern you adopted, right? right. Because you thought that is how it should be. So, um, so what kind of, do you also see like sexuality for more from an energetic and also spiritual perspective now than just no, the physical? It's hundred percent. I mean, everything is happening on multiple layers of reality. It's just how much are you aware of? And sexuality is the most powerful force on this planet. It's the most creative force. It's the life force itself expressed in a raw way through the human body. And it's certainly energetic on many layers, mental, emotional, physical, mm -hmm. spiritual, whatever that means to you. And yeah, I would invite anyone listening to this to experiment with that, with their own body, with safety, consent, and desire, and find out what is possible and how the human body and pleasure is actually a spiritual pathway. Yes, yeah, it definitely is. And I think then a whole new world will open up. So, and also it kind of makes you see that you, just you as a person, you are so much more powerful than you think. And there's also so much more to you that you don't know. Um, right. Yeah. And um, what I also really wanted to ask you something about was um, also about altered states of consciousness and kind of how it has, and this can also be experienced through sexuality, of course, as well. Um, but kind of, how, kind of how it has changed and transformed you on your journey and yeah, how it has really impacted your life. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of the biggest loves, passions, things I've studied and practiced is altered states broadly. And mm -hmm. an altered state of consciousness is just really anything that's not normal, everyday, socially, culturally accept acceptable mindset or state of consciousness. So altered states have been used and there are many techniques, traditions, as many as there are people on the planet for thousands of years to access healing, to access creative states, to facilitate connection with the divine, to really open up doorways that are beyond thought, speech, and the language we use just for chopping wood and carrying water. And so that's, that's been a love of mine and you know the go-to pathway where my creativity comes from where my productivity comes from where my deep desire and love is sourced from and how I personally have developed my own spiritual practice and path without using religion without using you know the various cults available on the mainstream market to live my best life yeah so how did like the other state of consciousness so kind of in what ways do you um, want to explain? So how do you kind of discover that? So we do have this older state of consciousness. Is it like true meditation or more true maybe psychedelics or like breath work? Um, what kind of helps you discover that we can access these, all these different states? I mean, I was, I was accessing them naturally as a child. Mm -hmm. I later realized. And that was just me sitting alone in nature or sitting and staring off at the wall or free writing or free drawing or going on these huge imagination journeys in my, my head as a, as a child, as early as I can remember, like age three and going into deep altered states. And then later, you know, rediscovering them and realizing what I've been doing. And meditation is the easiest one. Daydreaming visualization is an easy one. The dreams you have every night are in a deep altered state of consciousness. And then, yes, later through the yogic practices, through martial arts, through plant medicine, shamanism, sexuality, tantra, then you open up a whole realm and tool set of altered states, which I have experimented with all of those extensively mm -hmm. and I'm still on that journey. And this is one of my great passions and tool belts, really. And I think it's everyone's tool belt on some level, you know. Drinking tea or coffee in the morning is an altered state of consciousness, you know. Speaking language is an altered state of consciousness if you let it be. So it's like, it really is 
just tuning the radio dial of humanity to where you need it, where you want it. Everyone's doing it on some level. It's just how consciously and to what end. Yeah. And what I'm also interested about what you mentioned as well is about the dreams. So, of course, we're in a completely different state of consciousness when we're dreaming. Um, so kind of how did that, how did you kind of, did you do like dream analysis or you, you, you also mentioned the work of Carl Jung? So how oh, yeah. did kind of dreams help you on a journey? Yeah, dreams were huge, huge. That was one of my great loves. You know, I was dream journaling extensively in really in high school and then encountering the work of Carl Jung sent me on this mm -hmm. whole journey. And I wanted at first to be like a psycho analyst mm -hmm. of dream psychology and depth psychology and symbols. And I mean, dreams account for a third of our life and it's a whole different reality and there's deep symbols and healing and creativity that's living in your dreams every night and it's just there for you to you know interact with and encounter in life and really find out what it means to you and it can solve problems you're having in waking life it can give insights it can provide healing and it can just be a lot of fun too or it can be a nightmare depending on how you're relating to them yeah so then you kind of like after you wake up, then you start journaling. Um, yeah, that's basically. the basic idea is just write them down. Yeah. And do you also have different techniques or methods you use to kind of analyze the dreams or um, what do you do? I mean, really, it's pattern recognition. There's mm -hmm. tons of traditions and techniques, and you can read all kinds of lucid dreaming, and there's the Mayan Toltec dream methods, and there's the Western dream methods. The Egyptians have some, the Chinese have some, the Hindus have some. You know, there's all kinds of modalities, but the basic idea is just notice patterns. Mm -hmm. So what symbols show up all the time? What people show up all the time? Where are you? What are you doing in the dream? And start to piece that together, and that's why keeping a journal Let's you notice the patterns. So then you can start to prime yourself that when that pattern happens again, you can become lucid in the dream and interact with your own sovereignty. Or the next time it happens, you can start to gain the lesson that it's showing you. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really cool because I've also been really interested into it as well. And also like um, for a long time, I've just when I woke up, I would... Um, just journal for usually like three pages and to not really think about what I'm going to write but to really let that writing process really flow and what I've really noticed a lot that a lot of th things you kind of suppress uh, they all show up in your dreams and what I've right. also noticed is that also in within our dream like a whole I guess I also do a lot of work around grief that's also a whole grieving process that comes up so a lot of the people that kind of show up in your dreams and people you've let go of, um, people you're still missing or people you're so angry at. And those are, can, can be the people, that's what I noticed with myself, that really show up. And um, I think it's really powerful uh, to, to do dream work and also to really do it intuitively. Mm. Um, yes. Because usually you really know a lot more uh, than you already think you do. It's just right. laying uh, the connection. Yeah. yeah, I agree. So how did kind of doing the dream work uh, change your life? For you, it had a really big impact, of course, because you're so interested in it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was, for a while, it was my obsession. And it really taught me to pay attention to reality because your conscious mind can't tell the difference between a dream and waking reality. And that's why you aren't lucid or, you know, you don't realize your dream until you wake up. And there's even phenomenon where you can wake up from a dream into another dream, you know, like inception type stuff. And it's just really, it's a common phenomenon we all experience that's accounting for 33% of human life that isn't talked about much and is a mystery like science modern science doesn't understand why we need to dream 
They have lots of theories, but they do not understand it. And, you know, for me, it just really taught me and showed me that reality is not what it seems and that to be mm -hmm. curious and to be aware and to use my attention wisely. So why do you think we dream? Just, I, I think there's two sides, at least, if not more. One side is like the psychologist, like Freud first pointed out, that it's processing unmet desires and trauma and needs and experiences from waking life in the dream world, which is like our own personal simulation or something mm -hmm. like that. And I believe that non-physical, supernatural, shamanic, ethereal, astral, whatever you want to call it, phenomenon are also at play. So we are not just our bodies mm -hmm. and the dream world is as real as this one in a sense. And this is where people have left their body while sleeping or traveled or met dead loved ones or dead pets or seen the future, had prophetic dreams. You know, there's a whole supernatural reality in the dream world that isn't always present in the waking world for most people. And so this can really be seen in dreams and everybody dreams. Yeah. yeah. And why do you think it is that a lot of people have problems with falling asleep and with dreaming? So waking up a lot of times during the night, I don't know if it's something maybe you analyze or question. Because yeah, I mean, a lot of it can be seen as like physiological where your diet and your habits mm -hmm. and your your lifestyle will cause your body to wake up and not have that deep healing sleep. And I think, you know, yeah, psychic, emotional, mental phenomenon while you're sleeping can affect you and react to you and this will impact your sleep. And, you know, I've been an insomniac. I've had... Mm -hmm a lot of trouble with sleep, which is why I got fascinated in dreams because I could remember them because I woke up a lot. And yeah, it's, it really comes down to stress, relaxation and being okay with your sleeping patterns the way they are and knowing that the more you stress about it, the less healing you're going to get from it. And so it really is a process of surrender. Yeah. So actually also the dream journaling and really becoming aware of your dreams also helped you to with the insomnia you suffered from? Um, yes and no. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I would say more like being in my body, doing Qigong, Tai Chi, martial arts, mm -hmm. meditation, biohacking, you know, changing the way I do my diet, changing the way I and then my body is the most helpful because it allows me to calm my nervous system and get into a good circadian rhythm. Um, yeah, and also using plant medicine and herbs, you know, there's all kinds of great herbs and plants that help the body naturally sleep. And so, and yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really a game of, you know, finding your equilibrium. Okay, so it was also like a combination of a lot of different things you were doing at the time. Yeah. yeah okay so also the question if you maybe just have some last advice for maybe men but also women who kind of want to get more into the flow of like inspired action and we following up with action and being committed do you maybe have some last advice some tips or what helped you along your journey I mean, it's really as simple as follow your bliss, do what you most desire and most want now and don't wait. Mm -hmm. Like there's nothing worth waiting for or sacrificing your dreams for. And you can still be realistic. You can still be logical. You can still play the human game well. But to live your life unfulfilled is never worth it. And all you need to do is spend time in an elderly care facility or spend time with people that are dying and talk to them about what they regret. And it's never working more, saving more money, protecting themselves, hiding from life. It is always they regret not 
doing what they love the most and telling and being around the people they love the most that they love them. So it's like, it's as simple as that. And you're living in a time in human history where that's never been more easily facilitated through technology and community. Yeah. So thank you very much. And I think it's definitely important to realize and also that the time is now and, um, yeah, it would be sad to kind of let all the things, all the opportunities you can take and all the opportunities we actually have right now to let them pass you by. Right. Yeah. Totally. So, Kevin, I really want to thank you for uh, being here today and being open and sharing uh, more about your journey. I think it will be very helpful for a lot of people listening. So, again, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Sane, and thank you, everyone watching listening wherever that is appreciate y'all okay thank you everyone wishing you a beautiful week